So in this video, I'd like to talk about another technique that rootkit writers use, and this is specifically a kernel mode technique known as direct kernel object manipulation, or DKOM, or, or even DCOM. And the idea behind this technique is, is to kind of directly modify objects that the kernel, that's kind of the operating system layer, uses for bookkeeping and for kind of general system maintenance. Uh, now, uh, object, is a, it's kind of a more of a Windows term. Uh, you know, this, this is, you may be more familiar with the term structure, and really by this I mean any kind of structure that holds uh, some interesting data that the, the system might need to use. It's kind of like a data structure that's located at a low level in the system. Okay, now before I, I describe uh, DCOM as a technique, I just want to talk about briefly, you know, why you'd even want to consider doing such a technique like this. And if you recall, uh, the other techniques I've mentioned in the previous videos on, on rootkits, uh, one technique I mentioned was something called hooking. Uh, and hooking is certainly a very powerful technique. It, it's obviously uh, a technique you'd want to use because you, you can't uh, directly modify code uh, all the time on a particular operating system or in a particular system in general. And, and really hooking was a way for you to kind of pull a little hook into someone's code or in, into running code that would then go to malicious code and then execute that malicious code. And in the process of hooking, you might actually execute the old code first, modify its results, and then kind of return the execution back to where it was before uh, after you've done the, the bad stuff. Uh, and, and hooking is certainly a very powerful technique, but at the same time, uh, you know, there are some drawbacks, and let me talk about a couple of drawbacks of hooking. Uh, so one drawback of hooking is that it can be relatively easily detected, and, and so I don't I want to say it's, it's, it's super easy, but you, you can actually detect it uh, taking place because you are talking about a situation in which somebody is modifying a very critical part of the system. Okay, and, and the key here is kind of knowing where to look, not just, you know, looking willy-nilly, but if you know where to look, you can detect hooking. Uh, another thing about, about hooking, which is uh, kind of a bit of a drawback, is that um, there are more and more uh, what we call kernel, let me kind of write that nicely, kernel, kernel protection mechanisms. And by that, I mean things like read-only pages in the kernel and, and, and things of that nature, uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, just anything you can imagine uh, that might actually inhibit the possibility of hooking just because hooking does require being able to write to certain, especially the kernel does require being able to write to certain portions uh, of the kernel which might not be allowed uh, because the kernel might may be set up so that nobody is allowed to write to those certain portions of the kernel. And so you can't always apply hooking uh, to, to work. And, and so if you're not able to do those two things, a lot of malware authors might do uh, DKOM. And let me kind of give you DKOM, DKOM in, in the way of an example. And, and um, the classic example in which DKOM is used is to modify the, the running process list on a kernel. So for example, um, inside the kernel, there is uh, what's called a doubly linked list of running processes. And these are defined by things called e-process blocks. And so you, have a, you might have an e-process block for every running process. Uh, and so there might be an e-process block. And let's call the first running process good one, just to signify it's a good process, it's, it's, it's benign. Uh, maybe it's running, and there's a block, there's a data structure in the kernel that contains a block called the eProcess block for good, good process number one. And there are two pointers in this data structure. Um, there is a, a next pointer and a back pointer, so let me kind of write that out, next and back. And in this case, it, it, uh, for the first object, it, back doesn't make as much sense, but you'll, you'll kind of understand what back is in a moment. Uh, and, and again, there's one of these blocks for every single process that's running. So there's going to be another eProcess block for another process running. Uh, and now you can imagine that, uh, let's say there's a rootkit on the system, and the rootkit is running. If the rootkit is actually running, uh, there's going to be an eProcess block for the rootkit. Okay? Because it's, uh, it's a thing, a process running in the kernel. Uh, and uh, it's a process that's running, so the kernel is going to know about it. And just like with every other eProcess block, there's going to be uh, both a next pointer and a back pointer. Okay, and the idea is that the next pointers uh, will kind of point to the next block, and the back pointers kind of point back to the previous block. And this is how you can enumerate process lists. And, and, and let's imagine, for sake of uh, for the sake of example, you've got a third block here, and uh, this block contains also a good process. So let's say eProcess, and let's call this process uh, good two. Okay, and just like with the other eProcess blocks, it's going to have uh, 
two pointers, a next pointer and a back pointer. And in this case, the back pointer is going to pack the previous one. The next pointer here is going to point to the next block and so on. And, and, and there is no next pointer here. That kind of just goes to null. And the next pointer here, or the back pointer here will also go to null. Okay, so the idea is that the, the kernel itself maintains this data structure. This is a, a list of processes that are running. And what a rootkit can do is it can now, if, if it knows how to do it, it's not necessarily easy to do, but if it knows how to do it, a rootkit can go ahead and try to modify this structure directly. And in particular, what it'll do is it'll go and say, well, instead of making the next pointer point over here, what if I modified the location of the next pointer to point here? And likewise, the back pointer here, I'm going to modify the location of this back pointer and have that point right here. Okay, now the, the reason this matters is the way that if you were, let's say, enumerating a list of active processes, and this is the kind of thing that you can, when you run Task Manager on Windows, um, you know, or, or the comparable program on a Mac, uh, you will see a list of processes that are running. The way that process list is enumerated is that uh, there is a process by which you would go through this data structure in the kernel. You would start off at, at, at the first process block, which is kind of good one. You would follow the next pointer to get the next process running, follow the next pointer to get the next process running, and you'll keep doing that until you, you can't go anymore. And then that would be the list of processes that are going to be running, or the list that presented to the user is going to be the list that's amalgamated from going through this list of e-process blocks. Okay, if a rootkit is able to modify that list effectively by, by changing these two pointers, all they're doing is they're changing this pointer to skip over the rootkit and then changing the back pointers to skip over it backwards, then essentially, the, the entire computer no longer knows, the, the, the computer no longer knows about this rootkit. In, in fact, this rootkit now is more or less at a process level, has kind of vanished. No, nobody knows it's there. It, it, nobody knows this process is running because the place where you would check, that place has been modified. Okay? Now, you can also use the same technique for doing other things. So obviously, I've, I've talked about you can use DCOM for, for hiding processes. You can also hide other things besides processes. So for example, you can hide um, device drivers. And these are kind of low level, kernel level pieces of software that are running. You can hide device drivers uh, from the driver. Uh, you, can hide, uh, you can hide ports, uh, so that inhibits the ability to detect network communication. You can, um, you can elevate thread privileges, and I won't go into detail on, on, on what that means, and, and obviously by proxy, if you can elevate thread privileges, that means you can elevate process privileges as well. Okay, uh, and, and so on and so forth. In, in, in general, I think you can, you know, when you kind of point out in general, you can just sort of uh, um, hinder forensics. So if somebody's trying to figure out what happened on a system after the fact, they'll have a harder time doing so if you're able to modify kernel data structures directly, and this is something that a rootkit commonly does. Uh, one thing you cannot use DCOM to do is you cannot use it to hide files. So it can't hide files with this technique. Okay, it can't be used to hide files. And the reason for that is there's no sort of active file list in a data structure in the kernel. Um, if you want to hide files and you have to do, you have to either use hooking, um, another technique you can use if you want to hide files on a system is to, to have the rootkit install itself as a, as a layered filter driver. Um, and I won't go into any detail on what that means in this video, um, but suffice it to say really, kind of at a high level what this means is that your filter drivers, they can control the flow of what are called interrupt request packets or IRPs, and a rootkit could install itself as a filter driver and then control access to its own binary image on disk. So I probably said more than I intended to say about that, but hopefully uh, that'll give you an indication of, of what you might be able to do with the rootkit if you wanted to hide files with it. But for this particular technique, this would be good at hiding processes. It might not be so good at hiding files. Okay. Uh, the last thing I do want to mention, and, and this technique, I mean, it, it, I've drawn it and made it seem very simple by kind of just drawing these two pointers, changing and giving you this very simple picture. Uh, but the reality is that anything that involves manipulation of the kernel, anything that involves doing kind of low level uh, kernel hacking of any sort at the rootkit level, um, it's very, it's going to be inherently very unstable. And, and, and the reason for that is that there, the, the kernel is at such a low level part of the operating system that it's got a lot of risks. And you, whenever you write any kind of kernel code, you have to be very careful that you don't 
uh, do something even the slightest bit wrong because that can cause the system to go into an unstable state and crash and, and, and cause blue screens of death and, and things like that. So, um, you know, these are not techniques that can be used willy nilly, but because they're operating at a very low level, if you are able to successfully carry out something like direct kernel logic manipulation, um, then you will be able at a very low level to inhibit somebody from being able to find a rootkit. And, and this particular technique of, of modifying data directly, this is a very difficult technique to detect because you know, it doesn't really leave as much of a trace. Like if you look at something like hooking, um, you know, hooking leaves a very direct trace in the system. Here you're really talking about kind of removing something. There's kind of no trace now that this thing has been removed after the fact, at least based on kind of current state of the art, the way that, that operating systems and in particular Windows is currently designed. This kind of technique would be would be a hard one to detect. Anyway, I hope you found this useful, and I'll continue to do some more videos on rootkits to um, help illuminate some of the key ideas. Thank you, and I'll see you in future videos.